So welcome everyone to this late April Thursday evening Dharma talk at Mountain Cloud. Welcome in the Zendo. Welcome in the cloud. It's a joy to offer our practice, to receive the embrace of one another's support, and maybe to catch a glimpse of wonder. Just to sit and breathe and be. One sitting, all pervading, excluding nothing. Lately, I've been sitting with a haiku, which some of you will have heard. It's by the renowned 20th century haiku poet, Yoko Tokutomi. Kyoko was a Japanese woman with a very poignant story, love and loss, that always seemed weighted toward love. She spent much of her life in the United States, so wrote in Japanese and in English. Here is her verse. Shaking the packet of seeds asking, are you still alive? Keeping company with this haiku reminded me of one by Basho, great master Basho, which is possibly his most famous verse. He wrote, ancient pond, frog jumps in, sound of water. In her book, Three Simple Lines, Natalie Goldberg discovers this haiku in a fresh way, and she writes about that moment. Here is Natalie. Was it morning as I was munching toast outside, or turning a corner in the car, or glancing at my watch about to go to an appointment? Yes, that was it. Reaching for the knob, the door casing, the single window in the green painted wood, I stepped over the threshold. His mind was empty. That's all there was, sitting or standing by the water. The flash movement of the frog, then the sound, the sound, the sound filling his ears his mind and heart. Nothing else in the whole world. The realization poured through me, she writes, like a waterfall rushing to the bottom. She goes on, it might have been a dentist appointment, piles of people magazines, two stray New Yorkers, a white paper cup of half-drunk tea on the table, the round impression of another one on the glass surface, hum of a drill in a room beyond the waiting room. I was no longer waiting. I had arrived in the middle of a famous haiku, no longer left out outside wanting in, no in or out, no nothing, something, the old pond of the mind, finally quiet. There's a slightly different translation then that comes following this passage. At the ancient pond, a frog plunges into the sound of water.
Natalie Goldberg comments, Basho is that frog. So what about us? What about now? Kyoko's haiku about seeds led me to do some research. How do you know if seeds are still alive? Take the seeds and place them in a container of water. Let the seeds sit for 15 minutes. If the seeds sink, they are still viable. If they float, the instructions say, discard because they probably will not sprout. Then the description goes on. The process that occurs in gardening is just this. A seed is planted, and in order for life to grow from it, it must die. The life breaks free from the seed and sprouts into something new leaving behind the shell of what once contained it. Shaking the packet of seeds, asking, are you still alive? Is it we who are asking about the viability of this packet of seeds? Or are the seeds addressing us with the question, are you still alive? At last Saturday Zazenkai, I suggested, let your practice be the answer. That was a beautiful day of practice. For tonight, I'd like to turn to a koan that speaks to this question. Dead? Alive? And in the process, shows what this fully here life looks like. At least it strikes me that way. So first, just a quick note. This past week, a student online described a persimmon blossom outside in the yard. I wish I could share that fragrance with you, she said. Maybe here, is a whiff of it. This is case 36 in the Blue Cliff Record or Hekigan Roku. It's called Chosa Goes for a Walk. The case. One day, Chosa went for a walk in the mountains. When he returned to the gate, the head monk asked, where have you been, master? Chosa said, I was out walking about in the mountains. The head monk said, where did you go? Chosa said, first I went following the scented grass. Then I came back through the falling flowers. The head monk said, it sounds very much like a spring mood. Chosa said, it's better than the autumn dew dropping on the lotus flower. Secho commented, I am grateful for that answer. Students, sometimes say, I don't get the koans. Don't worry about it. Maybe the koan is an old story inviting us to taste something fresh 
about our own lives. Maybe it sparks a turning word, a moment of surprise that ushers in a glimpse of the real, something more real than our discursive minds can figure. Or maybe it's like the fragrance of a persimmon blossom. The prevailing wind shifts and you catch just a whiff. In this case, the koan is about Chosha, Chosa, or Changsha, a ninth century Chinese ancestor who was a Dharma heir of Nansen, Nanquan, and so a Dharma sibling of Chaochu or Master Joshu. I'll just call him Chosa. Chosa ordained as a monastic at an early age. He lived for a time in the city of Changsha at Lushan Temple. But for most of his life, he roamed China, expounding the Dharma according to the situations he encountered. His style of teaching is described as pointed and direct, even aggressive. There's a story from the record, and I'm turning again to Andy Ferguson's wonderful book, The Chinese Zen Masters and Ancestors. So here's the story. Chosa and Kyozan, sort of a Dharma cousin, they were gazing at the moon, just enjoying the moon. Kyozan said, everyone is completely endowed with this, but they are unable to make use of it. Wonderful comment. We're all endowed with this earthen floor, with this beautiful pit marks and all of its kin hinge soaked into it. How will we use it? We're endowed with the candle, we're endowed with the statue, with the flower, with the evening light, with the wind and the trees. Everyone is completely endowed with this, but they're unable to use it. Chosa turned and said, I invite you to use it now. Kyozan asked, how would you use it? Chosa knocked Kyozan down with a shove to the chest, then stepped on him. Kyozan responded, whoa, just like a tiger. The name stuck, Chosa, great tiger. This case with Chosa walking walking out in the mountains is much later, nearer to the end of his life. He certainly matured and softened such ease and freedom. Some say no trace of enlightenment remained. Chosa has gone out from the monastery and when he returns, the head monk meets him there at the gate. Where have you been, master? It's an essential question. We hear a tenor of challenge in the monk's question, like he's trying to start a Dharma duel, you know, this way of, so to, so to speak, combat, trying to show who's got the clearer eye, who can really present this fact, this world, who we are. Will Chosa answer this question? Where have you been? Will he answer it with reference to geography? Maybe naming a place 
like so many monks in the koans do. Where have you been? Where do you come from? I was out walking about in the mountains. Chosa can't help but show himself fully. As Master Unman puts it in another case, complete exposure of the golden wind. Here you might say it's the spring wind, which is certainly blowing in our part here, this neck of the woods. Brian Roshi calls Chosa a real ordinary person. No shadow, no shape, no one there, and no friction. If the monk's question is a hook, Chosa doesn't even smell the bait. I was out walking about in the mountains. Each sound is where he is walking, has been walking all along. There are the mountains. There's the view. There are his steps. I was out walking. The head monk asks again, is it more challenge or now intrigue? Where did you go? Chosa responds, first I went following the scented grass. Then I came back through the falling flowers. If you went for a walk today, you might say something like that. tree outside the window where I work at home is just loaded with these blossoms. It just couldn't be more fulsome. And any day they'll start falling. Chosa has an earlier teaching that became quite well known speaking about awakening to this awake world, the real world, this world. He said, even though one who is sitting on the top of a hundred foot pole has entered realization, it is not yet real. You must step forward from the top of the pole and manifest your whole body throughout the world in 10 directions. Sitting in Zaza, total emptiness, complete cessation is not yet it. To realize the empty, infinite, borderless world as the tradition says, the untrammeled world of no hindrance and great freedom, we have to take a step, one step. Or maybe that step takes us. Suddenly, your separate self dies like the husk of a seed, and there is nothing that is not you. Manifest your whole body throughout the world in 10 directions. In the record of Chosa, this teaching gets elaborated. Monks are gathered waiting for a word and Chosa goes on a rant. I 
think this would predate that walk. He says, if I give you some Dharma teaching, then there will be grass growing in the hall 10 feet deep. All these concepts. But this is something that can't be stopped. So I say to you that all worlds pervading the 10 directions are the true monk's complete body. Pervading all worlds in the 10 directions is your own brilliant light. All worlds in the 10 directions are within your own light. Sometimes you could sense this, like everything's going on in my body. There's just no edge. And he goes on, and throughout all worlds in the 10 directions, there is not a being that is not you. If only we could see that. No more strife. Out walking in the mountains, where did you go, Master? First I went following the scented grass. Then I came back through the falling flower. I'd like to share uh, briefly a story that was shared with me. This is by permission, and it's just the outline of an experience uh, that a longtime practitioner recently experienced in a traffic jam, sitting there, multiple lanes across standing at a red light in the car, counting breaths, following my breath. I looked up and there was a man driving a truck stopped nearby. So just sitting in his truck waiting. Noticed, I noticed his face was full of anxiety and strife and felt some concern. Gazing at him, suddenly, I was that man. In that moment, I looked around at the other drivers waiting for the light to change, each face shining, each one me. In that moment, I felt as though I could face any interaction with any person, however troubled, face it fully with no hindrance. The experience continued for a while. I was reminded hearing this of that famous famously documented experience of Thomas Merton at the fourth of, well, at the corner of fourth and Walnut in Louisville. And he's out on an errand, this, you know, monk. Um, and suddenly something shifts and he looks up and says, each face is shining like the noonday sun. They are mine and I am theirs, he exclaimed. We could not be alien to one another. Chosa conveys the reality of no hindrance, wandering in the world of fragrant grass and falling blossoms. Just that. The head monk remarks, it sounds very much like a spring mood. There could be some chiding there. Somehow he doesn't see the thoroughgoing beauty, the wildly varied activity of this all too human, all too creaturely world. 
but his comment elicits a response that's a teaching for all time. Chosa says, it's better than the autumn dew dropping on the lotus flower. The autumn dew, it's an expression for nothing at all, empty. We need We need to experience it for ourselves, to see it, taste it. But on its own, the Drew Drop world is useless. There's no one there, nothing to do and no one to help. I was with Rian Rashi when he said, the dewdrop world must be forgotten. But once we see this, we can't forget. We can only deepen it. Realizing itself, taking that one step, he said, is emptiness, actually. There's no other empty than this. Can you taste it? This. Without any bifurcation beyond any measure, Chosa is saying this real world is better than emptiness, a spring mood, but it could readily be otherwise. He's simply enjoying this situation, taking it in. Spring mood, the matter at hand, is better than the essential world. This dewdrop, dewdrop world is sometimes likened to what's called absolute samadhi. Just sitting. Total composure, that balance. Nothing even there to keep in balance. And then the spring world is likened to absorption in activity, what's called positive samadhi. Haku and Zenji said, samadhi in real life is a hundred thousand times better than samadhi in quietude. And yet, oh, how it feeds the activity. Essential reality, boundless clarity, see it, taste it, deepen in it but don't stick to it. Chosa invites us, live in the world, a world where people are suffering. Creatures are in need and we have the capacity to respond. The last line of the case is a comment inserted by Secho, the compiler of the collection. Secho adds, I am grateful for that answer. Maybe he's grateful for the whole conversation, the joy of life as it is, this human world, broken with the capacity to break all the way open. Looking into this koan, I came across an article by Ben Gallagher from 2015 that I'd just like to share a bit. Gallagher is a poet, 
essayist art education, art educator, and a Zen practitioner. One evening in 2013, 10 years ago now, his wife Zoe went out for a run. While she was gone, he made dinner and sat down with a book. When her absence seemed a bit too long, he went out searching the neighborhood. Before long, he came upon the scene of an accident. Police caution tape all around. Zoe had been struck by a drunk driver. She died in the ICU. Following her death, Ben found himself faced with the question, where are you now? Finally, getting up the courage to attend a session, he asked his teacher for a koan. And the Roshi suggested that Ben sit with this case, case 36, Blue Cliff Record, Chosa going for a walk. In his article, Ben writes, Chosa is exactly where he is. The beautiful world that he sees is the world in front of him, not yesterday's world or the world of the coming autumn. When I am Chosa, what is my world? It is sadness. When I sat with this koan last year, he goes on, I felt that the koan was asking me to see the beauty that is everywhere in the world, but I wasn't ready to do that yet. What if the beauty in my world is my sadness? All I knew was that Chosa wasn't trying to be anywhere else, and if I was sitting with Chosa, I was going to have to be sad with my whole being. One all-pervading reality. Gallagher goes on to describe the winding path toward healing, that path with 99 curves that Zen invites us to go straight on. How, in order to be true to yourself, how will you go straight on that narrow mountain path with 99 curves. The article ends with this line. I'm not sure if there will ever be a moment when the question, where am I now, isn't the most challenging thing to ask. Where have you been, Master? I was out walking about in the mountains. The last line of Secho's verse to this case reads, Chosa's mind is limitless. Chosa's mind is limitless. And then there's this exclamation that gets translated, ha! Just, ah, there's his mind. It's not possible to wander in the mountains. These mountains, unless your mind is boundless. And it is. Boundless includes everything, suffering and joy. Chosa's great freedom and ours 
our native ground. Thank you for this shared practice.